Okay. So like I said, so early on, you know, if I'm writing the compiler, I actually get to decide what instructions do what. So what would my compiler name be? Well, I would probably call it Shannon because it's named after me. Okay. Um, and or some weird name, who knows. And so you get these different types of compilers. So, you know, early on, uh, we had eight, I think. Uh, Pascal was a programming language. Fortran, Basic. Now you have C, C++, Visual C, Java, Python. Have you all ever heard of any of these, these languages? Java programming, say, for instance. So these were kind of developed organically over time. And the people that developed these were probably what we would call nerdy, modern time. Um, and they would catch on. Okay? So Microsoft came along and basically said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to try to formalize some of these languages. So they developed a language, probably already partially developed, that was called BASIC. And the purpose of BASIC was to introduce people that weren't used to programming or weren't used to computers at all to some type of basic language. And early on, you know, some of these were called in schools and then, um, you know, that was the purpose behind it. And it was just a text-based language. It would do basic things. And then in the 90s, a new concept called visual programming came along. You know, back when I was younger, all programs were basically just text-based. You know, you'd have to put one, enter for something, or two for something if you wanted to make a selection. All of this is now visual. You know, I have these toolbars I can click on, and so things kind of change. The basic, when I started college back in 1996, I took a programming language called BASIC. Within a year or so, um, and it may have even been out then when I took it, it just wasn't offered, but another programming language called Visual Basic came along. And so I actually took it again, even though I didn't really get credit for it because I wanted to learn, learn the language. So what Visual Basic is, just the formal definition, introduction to the Visual Basic event-driven event -driven programming language uh, with emphasis on producing working documents, includes how to design a Windows interface, how to set the properties of an object on the interface form, how to code, debug, execute, document the actions behavior of selected objects. Uh, we talk about uh, structured algorithms, branching, looping, problem solving, and that sort of thing. Okay? So the short answer to what Visual Basic is, is it's, it's a language. It's just it's a programming language, just like English or Spanish or French. It is a language that someone or a group of people have written over the years that allows you to put in commands that will get the computer to do something. So most of you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with computers. You use them on a daily basis. How many in here have, it, have ever done any computer programming? No computer programming. Has anyone ever wondered about how pro or computers work, like where the programs come from? Just kind of like, just kind of magic, right? I mean, where do these things come from? Well, someone writes the code that runs these. So when I say they write the code, we all kind of know what code is, but we really don't know what it is. It's computer code. What does that really mean? Well, the, what I want you guys to get out of this class is a fundamental understanding of how to write computer code. Now, this course is taken, usually engineering technology majors take this course, it's not meant to be a, um, a high-level programming course. When you come out of this course, I don't expect you to be a professional programmer, okay? The purpose of Visual Basic is to give you a tool to put in your tool bag so if you have a problem, you have something to develop the solution with, okay? It's not to come out of this class and to be able to learn how to program professionally and go out in the industry and be a computer programmer. You know, if you want to do that, you probably need to be in computer science if that's your goal. The purpose of this course is to take someone, say, that's an engineer, you're faced with a problem, say it's a problem, 
where you need to go in and repetitively do something, usually that's what computers are good at doing. How do you formulate the problem and implement some type of solution? Okay. The text, um, uh, the, the, te the bookstore had the text for this. Um, it was basically uh, listed before I decided I was going to be the instructor for the course. I don't really like the textbook. So I'm not requiring a text, okay? I have a supplemental text here. Um, if you want to get it, you know, I'd probably recommend you got it. Just buy the Kindle version. You can rent it for like $11 for a semester. Uh, but if you don't get it, it's not that big a deal. I'm going to give you everything that you need that you need to use for this course, okay? Now, when I took this course many, many, many years ago, in 1996, um, I'm going to be honest with you, the course really sucked. It was, it was a pretty bad experience. Um, I knew a little bit about basic programming from learning how to program on a TI-81 uh, that I bought when I was in high school because I was just kind of geeky like that. And it had its own programming language, very a basic, basic programming language. And uh, you know, I used to spend hours writing little programs on it because I didn't have a computer, okay? And you know, I didn't get a computer until probably, um, I don't know, probably 93, probably 94. And then I didn't really know how to do anything with it. You know, we didn't have the internet back in those days. So you'd get like a DVD with an encyclopedia on it and you would look up stuff and hit the speaker and it would make noise or you'd get a video game or something like that. I had a basic um, word processor on it. But I would have loved to have had access to something like this when I was a teenager. I would have really, really enjoyed that. Um, so obviously, computer usage. We're going to need to be using a computer. So we're going to be using Moodle. Uh, have any of you all had a chance to log into Moodle yet for your classes? Okay. Um, I've got a Moodle shell set up, so I have to, today I'll go ahead and get this, I'll enroll everyone in it and send you an email, and I'll start posting the material, the course, syllabus, and tutorials and that sort of thing on here, okay. Requirements, your BSc students, so you're going to meet those requirements. Um, here are some program outcomes relating to the course. Okay, these are just formal things you usually put into your syllabus. Now, the goals and objectives of this course. Um, after successfully completing the course, you should be able to understand the following. So I have about three pages of things that I want you to learn out of this course. Okay. Now, when I teach a course, what I usually do, I start out with the course. I tell you how useful I think the course is going to be. So Brandon, you're in the back. You've had some of my courses, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what's the most useful course you've ever taken in your entire life at Bluefield State or anywhere? I'd say that Operations Research. Operations Research. And I told you it would be one of the most useful oh, courses yeah. you ever took, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. So this is a senior level course that I teach. This course will probably not be the most useful course that you ever take in your life. It'll be the second most useful course that you've ever taken in your life. No, um, this course has the potential of being useful. I will say in my career, in my life, the skills that I personally learned in this class, I have probably used more than any other course that I have personally ever taken, okay? Now, I'm not a computer scientist, I'm an engineer, but throughout my life, throughout my college experience, throughout my professional career, um, I've just run into a lot of problems that require the use of a computer and I would always fall back on using Visual Basic, okay? So you're going to find this useful, hopefully, across, you know, different courses you're in. Maybe you'll be able to apply some of these skill sets. Uh, part of the reason why I'm teaching the course and part of the reason why it's formatted, formatted the way it is, is when I first came here to Bluefield State in 2011, I was teaching an electronics power system course. I forget exactly what the course was. But that morning, you know, it was the end of the semester, <clears throat> some students walked in and I heard them talking. And I heard one of them say, yeah, that Visual Basic course, that thing's killing me. And one of them said, yeah, it's about the most useless course I've ever taken. 
And I stopped and I said, excuse me, I said, what are you guys talking about? They were talking about the course and they were like, that course is just useless. I said, really? And they said, yeah. I said, I find that very interesting. I said, because for me, it's one of the most useful skills that I've ever learned. And so to hear someone say that this was a terrible course, it was useless and that sort of thing, and here I am saying, well, I use this on a very regular basis. So I thought, you know, I'm going to try to change this course at some point. And I became dean of the school, and then I started working on getting the course changed. Now, part of the reason why I think they were saying the course was useless wasn't because the instructor um, who, who left, but not because they fired, were fired. They actually went on and got a better job, a better career. Uh, didn't know what they were talking about. It's almost like they knew what they were talking about too well. Is Visual Basic morphed over the years? And the last good version of Visual Basic, in my opinion, was Visual Basic 6, uh, which probably ended somewhere in the early 2000s. Then it became what's called Visual Basic.net. So they started trying to incorporate being able to write scripts for web development and that sort of thing. And they really missed the fundamental purpose of the course. Okay? They tried to turn it into a professional programming language. And to be honest with you, I don't, I don't know a lot of people that do a lot of programming with Visual Basic.net. Uh, I was never really able to figure it out, did a whole, it was too complicated. Uh, so I always kept an old version of, of Visual Basic where I had years ago, that's what I would do my programming in. But then I discovered something called VBA, uh, probably about 15 years ago, maybe longer now, about 15, 16. Um, Microsoft Office. Is anyone familiar with Microsoft Office? Anyone ever use Microsoft Office? Well, Microsoft Office has a whole programming language built into it. It's called Visual Basic for Applications. And basically, it is Visual Basic. So you can program in Excel, you can program in PowerPoint, you can program in Microsoft Word. Um, almost all of the applications have a hidden layer that you've probably never even known, you never even knew exist, existed, uh, that essentially gives you the full power of Visual Basic. So the reason why I like to program using VBA instead of a Visual Basic compiler is you all have access to it and you always have access to it. Because here's what happens. If you learn a programming language and you're not, say, a computer scientist, and you learn how to program, when you walk out of the classroom you'll probably never use it again. I would say, especially once you get out of college, I'm going to say a 90 plus percent chance you never use it again. And part of the reason why you'll never use it again is because it's a little complicated to write the programs and to get them compiled and to get them distributed. So you have to download a compiler, you have to uh, write your code in some editor, and then you have to compile it, turn it into an executable, and you run it, and then you have to give it to someone, and it may or not work on their machine because they don't have the right DLL dynamically, libraries, and all these things. So you say, ah, the heck with it, I'm not fooling with it, I'll do something else. Visual Basic, um, if you have access to Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel or PowerPoint, usually Excel is what I use, you can write a program, literally get it up and running in seconds. So because it's useful, you're more likely to use it. Um, and that's why I decided that that's the language that we're going to actually use because I don't want to teach you a skill set and you never use it. That's just, in my opinion, that's just a waste of time. And um, you know, there's a lot of college programs out there. Uh, you know, they'll teach you C++ or Java, or maybe you'll learn MATLAB or Mathematic or something like that. And then you go out in the industry and you have to say buy the software to write the code in, and it costs a thousand or two or five or whatever it is, and you can't get your employer to buy it because uh, eh, we don't really need that. Learn something else. With Office, you've got it. Okay. So that's what we're going to be learning in this course. Okay, we're going to make every effort to cover the material, um, but if we don't, we don't. Uh, quizzes may be given during any class period or lab. I put that on there to give myself options, but I've never really done that. Okay, The way I give quizzes are usually in the form of class participation which is usually in the form of instead of me asking you a question or asking you a question and putting you on the spot 
I'm going to have um, assignments that I give, maybe tutorials, maybe little mini assignments and that sort of thing. And that's kind of how I gauge your participation. Uh, because I'm teaching the hybrid course, some people may not be here all the time, they may not be in class. So I need some way to gauge uh, participation. So instead of me having to keep track of who I've asked a question and make little check marks, somewhat arbitrary, I just kind of, you do these assignments, you get full points. So that's an easy 20% of your grade. I mean, out of the gate, everyone should start out with a 20 in this class because all you have to do are these assignments. And the assignments are essentially basically just watching a video and copying the code that someone else has done. All right. There's a lot of value in copying code. Um, I write programs on a pretty regular basis and you know the first thing I do is plagiarize. All right. I get online, I look at some message board, I look at expert exchange is something I use, um, ask Google a question, it'll bring up the code, copy and paste the code, paste it in, make a few changes. Um, that's really how the modern programmer works, is you use the web as a resource. Now, you know, I'm not saying to cheat, but I'm also naive, I'm not naive in the sense that, you know, if it's out there, you're going to use it. And my philosophy also is, is that that is, that's actually part of the, the modern tool set that we've been given. You know, when I was learning to program, we had a book that was about this thick, and it would go over the basics, but anything that you needed to know that wasn't in that, you really had to think about it um, and figure it out for your own or find someone that was better than you to help you out. So I don't know how programmers even programmed here's a code looking back uh, without the resources that we have. I know how they did because I did too, but it was just really, really hard. So I run into problems where I could work on it for days and not figure out how to do it and you Google it and you know within five or ten minutes I have the code up and running. Okay. So I understand the web is a very valuable resource. Um, you know, my philosophy as an instructor, as a professor, is probably significantly different than a lot of other instructors uh, that you'll come across in your college career. So you can't use my experience to necessarily translate when you go into someone else's classroom. Um, over the summer, my daughter, um, was she's 10, we were going somewhere and she asked me a question and it was something about, she's just kind of strange like me a little bit I suppose, just very interested and curious. She was talking about playing this game where she was breeding llamas, okay? They weren't actually breeding, but you know, you take this llama and this llama and then you get the offspring. So she was asking me about how all that worked and I was trying to explain to her what I knew and then I was telling her about DNA and the mechanics and it's really the shape and all these complicated things going on and I said but I said I don't really remember how it worked I said but you don't really need to you can just look it up and she said dad she said that's very admirable that you would say that um, she said most teachers I have don't allow you to do that they say that's wrong that if you look it up you know use Google or something that you're really not learning and I said well that's just absurd I mean why memorize something like, that's why we have books, you know, otherwise it's like, oh, I'm going to commit everything to my mind and never write anything down. You know, modern technology is just an extension to that. So that's kind of my approach. Um, you know, I'll give you guys some assignments and, um, you know, if you work with each other, um, I actually promote that, working with one another. I don't promote someone doing all the work and then saying, give me a copy of your code. But if you work with each other, I think that's actually how you learn. I think that's much more effective than just uh, going it alone, okay? So I'll give three one-hour exams. They're probably really not going to be in-class exams. They'll probably be like assignments, and, you, you know, they'll take about an hour to complete. Um, the work I give is really kind of take-home work. So you don't really have to worry too much about coming into the classroom and me handing you a an exam and giving you an hour and you're panicking. I, I, I don't, you know, I know some courses work well like that. I suppose courses, especially at larger institutions where you have a few hundred people in the classroom, you have to do it that way. But 
you know, me being under stress and under pressure about how well I'm going to perform has never caused me to do better in a class or in life or anything like that. So um, also offer help, you know, if I give an assignment and you're having trouble, I'm the type of instructor that'll, well, maybe you should write this code down and then, and then see what happens and then what would happen, what would you need to add to make that work? Because my goal is to truly give you guys a skill set um, to learn how to do something, not to come in and try to play games with you and make sure we get a normal distribution of grades so I feel good about myself. Um, then I'll give a project. This is probably going to be the big one um, for your biggest grade. It'll be some project doing something. Uh, missed test can be made up, you know, for various reasons. I'm usually pretty flexible, but don't take advantage of it because uh, then I get mad if people try to take advantage of me. But, you know, I'm pretty easy going about that sort of thing. Um, standard grading. A to F, you know. I usually round up if you have an 89.5, you get a 90, that sort of thing. Attendance, expected. Then live text, uh, this is something that just where we do assessments, so it's not really that big of a deal. Okay, <clears throat> are there any questions so far about the, the class? One thing I'd like to do, and I always hated, um, when I was in school doing this, but don't, if it bothers you, don't freak out. It's no big deal. Uh, I'd like to go around and ask you to tell a little bit about yourself, just because I'm going to be seeing you in the classroom. So I kind of want to get a feel for what program you're in, if you're a freshman, you know, sophomore, just out of high school, where you went, that sort of thing. Um, so it's just really a brief introduction. You don't have to tell me your life story, but I do kind of want to get a feel for you know, tell me what program you're in, because uh, we probably have a mix. So we'll start over here and go around this way. Well, Just because. Oh, I'm a freshman in electrical engineering. I just graduated from Graham. And what's your name? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Ben, freshman in mechanical engineering. Okay. I'm Corey, I'm a freshman, and I'll be in electrical engineering. Okay. I'm Jonathan. I'm a freshman in mechanical engineering. I'm a freshman in mechanical engineering. Okay, so you, like I said, you can see that everyone in this class is in engineering. Um, no computer scientists, right? So this computer scientists don't even have to take this course. So the purpose of this course is really, we could rename it Programming for Engineering, all right? So that's what I want you to get out of this. Traditionally, you know, this course has been taught usually by someone that's in computer science. So it's kind of like, you know, a mathematician teaching you math. It sounds good, right? But if you're in engineering and you want to learn how to be an engineer, a math professor isn't always the best person to teach you mathematics because they're going to teach you from a theoretical point of view 
and they're just going to teach you the fundamentals. You learn it, and then you need it when you when you got it when you need it. You know, I personally think that um, if you notice our first two maths in the program, Tech Math One and Two, these are taught by engineering professors. Uh, years and years ago, there used to even be technical calculus courses, uh, but I think over time we just let the math uh, the math department take that. But if an engineer, you know, someone that can teach, not just someone that's, you know, because sometimes engineers don't do the best job in conveying anything. They're good at problem solving, but when it comes to conveying information, they may not be the best in that. But someone that's competent, someone that can teach, I think an engineer could teach you mathematics much better in terms of it being useful for your, your field, okay? So that's kind of the logic for this course. I'm not a computer scientist. Um, I didn't know how to program. I've actually done a lot of programming in Visual Basic. Uh, am I a professional programmer? Am I an expert? You can come in and ask me a question. It's like, oh, I don't know. Let me look at this just a minute and Google it. Oh, okay, you do this and this and this and that. So I'm not uh, probably the best programmer that's ever you've ever seen in Visual Basic, but I do know how to, to get things done, and I, and I know enough about it to, I think, teach it hopefully in a manner that you're that you're going to be able to a, um, to learn something. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start out and show you guys a, a simple program. Okay, so has, have any of you all ever used Excel? I mean, you, you've used that, right? So, you know, Excel has a lot of features built into it. Um, you know, like for instance, I'm going to just start out putting in some numbers and doing something like, uh, I'm going to do something like this. And then I want to say this equals this. And then I'm going to pull, say, these numbers down and these numbers down. Okay. And does anybody recognize those numbers? Has anyone ever seen those numbers before? Maybe some math geeks in here. These are called Fibonacci numbers. Has anyone ever heard of that? So you take 1, add it to 1, and get 2. 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, 5 plus 8 is 13, and that sort of thing. So very quickly, I just wrote a little script, little formulas. I mean, I knew what I was doing, but how long did that take me? That took me seconds to actually do that. Now, I could go in, you know, use an Excel. That's one way of doing it. I always use Excel. If it's easy to do in Excel, I just do it in Excel. But I could also write some code that would do something like that. So I'm going to go up here, say, under, um, you know, I'm going to make a command button here. I'm going to double click it. And it's going to bring up this editor. All right. And I'm going to do something like, I'm going to say 4i equal 1 to 10. Next, i. So this is just a little computer program that I'm writing. I'm just going to say sales, uh, we'll say sales I column, let's say 5 is equal to I. Okay. Little piece of code, three lines of code. All right. You haven't learned this yet, but I'm going to show you just how simple this is. What this is going to do is this is going to start out 4I equal 1 to 10. It's going to start out and let I be equal to 1. All right, I is equal to 1. It's going to go to sales down 1 over 5 and let it be equal to 1. So what it's going to do, it's going to go row 1 over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Put a 1 in here. All right. Then it's going to say next I. I is going to be 2. Sales 2, 5, equal to 2. It's going to come, so we'll put a 2 right here. Alright. Next I. Sales, or I is going to be equal to 3. 3 over 3, 5 is equal to 3. Okay. And it's going to populate this. So let me come here and just click the button. 
just watch what happens. See that? So that was just a little program I wrote. Just populate 1 to 10, just like that. Only three lines of code, all right? So now, what Excel is in this particular case is really just a display. I could have it doing all kinds of stuff in the background. We're going to learn how to do this. But a lot of times you actually need it to be printed out so you can actually see what's going on. So we can come in, and this is just a super simple example. So even though you don't know any syntax, you've got to learn syntax. That's what you're going to learn in this course. Did everyone follow me? Let me turn. Did anyone get confused with what I just what, what I just did? You don't have to understand why for is a word in this language. It's just someone years ago said F O R makes the computer do something, and that's what I mean by a programming language is essentially kind of a higher level. There's different levels of programming language. The fundamental is down into what's called machine code, which is zeros and ones. Okay. Then you go up a layer above that called assembly code. You start dealing with what's called hex, hexadecimal coding. And that is just instead of having zeros and ones, you use zero through um, F, I suppose. Um, yeah, it's F. And it's essentially a way to, instead of just having a one, zero, zero, one, that sort of thing, that you can have um, basically Four bits can be represented by one, one character. Okay, so then you go into assembly language, and then you get into a higher level programming language like Vis, uh, Visual Basic or Visual C or Java or that sort of thing. So we are really operating at a third level with what you're going to be learning in this course, kind of a third level language. So you know, when I was a student, you know, I would ask the forbidden question: How did they write Basic? I mean, or how did they write Visual Basic, or how did they write the compiler? Well, now I realize, actually now they have compilers that you can use to write other compilers, but it took us a while to actually get to that, to that point. The other day I was putting, building a trailer, and my dad was helping me put some sideboards, and we were having to drill through the steel, you know, we had a big drill, and I mean, it's just hard. We had to drill, I don't know, 20 holes, say. And so you're drilling through, you know, I don't know, eighth inch steel or whatever, and you're pushing the drill and the smoke's coming off of it. And I was talking to my dad, and I said, Dad, you ever wonder who invented the first drill bit? I mean, if you think this is hard, what was it like before you even had the drill bit? Or who made the tools? How did you make the first drill press? Um, I guess you just started with basic tools and you start working up. And that's what's happened with, uh, with programming. So we're going to be doing some pretty interesting things in this course. Um, you know, one thing that I did about, I don't know, it's been everything in my life now is years ago, but I'm going to say 10 years ago or so. I had a um, colleague when I was, I used to teach at Old Dominion University. And we got to talking one day about games and playing cards and that sort of thing. We both were into football. And I said, wouldn't it be cool to have playing cards uh, that the suits were the emblem of the team? And I said, wouldn't that be cool instead of just having hearts and spades and clubs and what's the other one? Heart, spade, club, diamonds, yeah. Yeah, wouldn't that be cool where you could have multiple suits and the suits would be like whatever your team is, the NFL, college, whatever. It's like, yeah, that would be cool. And so I looked it up like, well, I'm sure someone's come up with this, and, and you can buy them, and you couldn't. It's like, oh, okay, well. And then, so periodically we would, we would just kind of talk about it. And I waited, no one ever came up with it. So last year, um, periodically I'll have little projects that I just do, just little hobbies or just, to, you know, watching TV or something, I'll be coding or just doing something on the side. Uh, so I decided I'm going to write my own program to do this. That, you know, I've been wanting this now for a decade. No one's come up with it. Let me see how hard it would be. So I decided I would use Microsoft Publisher, investigated it, did it have a VBA editor. And so 
after about a week or so of work and hobby all the time, um, I wrote a program that basically took all the college teams in the NCAA and made playing cards out of them. So I reduced it down to the ACC because I'm a Clemson fan. And so like, here's an example of something that I use Visual Basic for to, um, to do something that I would have really had, without this skill, no idea how to do this. Okay? You can say, well, what's that got to do with making playing cards? Well, if you wanted to go in and do each individual emblem, you know, an ace and a two and a three and a four and a five, all the way up to a king, queen, that sort of thing, and move each individual emblem around, you know, you could do it that way, but that's going to take a long time. So then if you want to do a new team, you've got to do the whole, the whole thing over. So what I did was wrote a little program where I can put any image in, select the image, um, the color that I wanted the font, and hit go, and it'll read from a database, bring in all those images, arrange them in the way they're supposed to be arranged, and put them in one document to be printed out. So that's something that I used, um, used it for, uh, just kind of as a hobby. Um, another thing that I recently wrote a program for is usually when I give assignments, I will want it named a certain way because when I download those assignments from Moodle, whatever you name the assignment is what it will, when I download all of them, it's what it will give me. So I'll say something like last name underscore, uh, first name underscore, like COSC 201 underscore exam one dot XLS or something, okay? Well, do you think you guys listen? No, there'll be about five or six that just submitted as exam one. So when I download them, it just says exam one, exam one, exam one, exam one, exam one. And I have to go in and rename them and that sort of thing. So I little, wrote a little program that would take all of those files and automatically name them based on what folder it was in. So little time-saving things like that. Um, back in 2011 when I first came, I was asked to volunteer at the coal show that they have every two years over here at the Brush Fork Armory. And the dean of the school asked me if I would come and help, but he said, I don't really want you to do anything. He said, I just want you to observe. I know that you're an industrial engineer. I want you to see if you can make this process better. So people were coming in, and it was taking like 30 minutes to get into the show. They would be lined up. You know, you got these coal miners. They're mad. They don't want to have to wait. They just want to come in and look at the equipment. But we had to register them, and we had to put, you know, badges and everything. And uh, he said, do you see a way that you can streamline this process? I said, well, yeah. I mean, the first thing we've got to do is get an automated registration system. So I wrote the system. And uh, somewhere, Bootful Daily Telegraph, I'm on record as saying the next time we have this, it would have been in 2013, that my goal is to get the wait time down to five minutes or less. Since 2013, the wait time has definitely been five minutes or less wrote a little program in Visual Basic. You come in, first name, last name, company, title, enter, boom. Prints it out on a four by six index card. You take that index card, fold it in half. It becomes a uh, two by three, you put in a badge, you're done. So, you know, I'm an industrial engineer. Electrical is my bachelor's, but industrial is my PhD. So my goal is to figure out how to make things more efficient and so this was a tool that I used, okay? Um, so I want to show um, 